Welcome to episode 361 of the Reformed Brotherhood. I'm Jesse. And I'm Tony, and we are proud members of the Society of Reformed Podcasters. Oh, if the sky comes falling down for you, there's nothing in this world I wouldn't do. Hey, brother. Hey, brother. I think on this episode, we're covering all of the Psalms. That's what I understand. It's true. We're going to do all 150 or <laughs> 151 if you're in the Greek church. And this will be an episode that's about seven or eight hours. It's true. So buckle up, buttercup. Part one. But before we do that, <laughs> let's hear what you're affirming with on this episode. So I don't think anybody that's in the Telegram chat will be super surprised by this because we've been kind of playing around with this as a group. But there's a, a new AI. I love AI stuff. There's a new AI uh, image generator called Ideogram. It's I-D-E-O-G-R-A-M dot A-I. And uh, it's pretty amazing how it works. So you just... You type in like a short description of what you're looking at for, they have a couple like almost like preset filters, almost like filters. And uh, it just generates this weirdest, coolest stuff. Have you ever heard of this before? No, I've, I'm just hearing about it now. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. So like I sent you one earlier that the prompt was Charles Spurgeon dressed as Iron Man baptizing an infant. And uh, it, I think if, if, Charles Spurgeon ever dressed like Iron Man baptizing an infant, this probably is what it would look like. It's pretty epic. It's kind of hard to explain until you actually like go and do it. I've been playing around with it. I did uh, two 40-year-old white dudes with beards recording a podcast, and it pretty much generated a picture of you and me, complete with like they're sitting at a brewery. So <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how this uh, AI was trained, but it's it's pretty good. That's what AI does. I know. It's it's crazy, too, because, like, this is just like a computer model. It's not like there's some creative person who's, like, reading this and then, like, feeding what the computer should do. It's literally just, like, pulling together all this information from the Internet. I've been doing a lot with, like, Pokemon because that's an interesting, uh, like, an interesting amalgamation of things where it has to be able to understand a word that's not standard English, but also be able to like kind of combine that with standard English. It actually does a pretty good job of understanding what I'm asking for. So you should, I mean, people should check it out. It's, it's pretty cool. Sometimes uh, we, we're not going to do denials tonight, but I was going to do, if we were going to do denials, I was also going to deny this because sometimes it comes up with some weird, like kind of crazy stuff where almost like unhuman, inhuman kinds of stuff. I was playing around with it with uh, my wife and we were trying to make it do pictures of Westies and we wanted it to make a Westie, like a West Highland Terrier that was the size of Godzilla destroying a city. And it did this weird thing where it like replaced the Westies hands with pizza slices for some reason. So it's very strange how it pulls stuff together. It's it's almost like... Um, it's almost like when you have like a, a strange lucid dream where there's weird elements of things that get pulled in for some reason that don't make any sense. It's kind of crazy. It's almost like the internet is dreaming at this point. Which is essentially what AI is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, somewhere down the road, we're going to recognize that this was like the beginning of the end. Somebody typed in the wrong prompt into some like automatic image generator and it, the AI became self-aware and started taking over the internet. So it's both, this is like a combo action then. It's, it's both true. affirmation and denial. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It's both amazing and also incredibly scary. <laughs> Which is pretty much the internet, right? It's true. It's true. But seriously, like I'll, I'll have to send you this picture offline. This, this picture of two 40 year old white dudes recording a podcast, it both looks really amazingly real. But then also when you look too closely at it, the dude's face is like really messed up. And also the guy's headphones are like part of his face. So there's certain things the AI does really well and certain things it does really poorly. Like it's not quite sure what to do with hands. And it's funny because if you look at the pictures when they're sort of like thumbnails, you look at them quickly, they look amazing. And then you look at them a little bit closer and you're like, this is some uncanny valley kind of stuff going on. Yeah, that sounds about right. That sounds creepy enough just to be 
disturbing, yeah. even if it has some sense of accuracy. It's true. It's true. So what else are people using this thing for? I presume to just generate any kind of royalty free image that they might need or just out of sheer curiosity for what they well, can make. Yeah, the interesting thing about this is because the reason it's called ideogram is because the idea is you get like you put in a prompt and it gives you like a like a starting point for your own thinking. So it's not necessarily intended. It doesn't seem like it's intended for you to be using it to generate uh, like actual content, but to give you an idea for the content. So you see a lot of people like putting in prompts for logos, but the AI doesn't always know what to do with like with with words and text. So sometimes you'll say put in like you'll say generate a logo for the Reform Brotherhood podcast and it won't even get the words right. It'll spell the words wrong. Um or I tried to do one for the Reformed Arsenal, which is like my old blog name that I haven't done much with, and it can't get past Arsenal of Football Club. So no matter what I try to tell it to do, it pulls up the Arsenal Gunner logo. So there's a lot of people kind of like using it for ideation, I think, where they try to like generate a logo or something like that. There's also a lot of weird stuff that goes on where people are trying to do like interesting stuff with celebrities and yeah. But what's interesting about this one, and I'm sure they did this on purpose to keep people from like doing just inappropriate stuff. When you search for something, it's associated with your own handle and everything is public and you can't delete anything. So if you were to search for something like inappropriate or gross or gory or something like that, that gets associated with you permanently um, and it's funny because now there's a new movement on there where people are generating images that are like, let me delete my images. So I don't know. I think people are mostly just having fun with it right now. It strikes me as very similar to when, uh, chat GPT first came out where people were just playing with it and doing strange things. And then, you know, it was only a couple of weeks before people actually started utilizing it for productive means. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how this develops, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. I've drawn a lot of pictures of uh, West Highland Terriers doing interesting things like fighting Nazis and dressed like Captain America. I did an image of two West Highland Terriers recording a podcast that I think is pretty amazing. I'll have to put that up on the website. So yeah, I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> That's quite a history I know. that you're putting together. I know. I've only had it for like a day and I was in the car for most of that. We were traveling back home from a, a family trip and standing in the uh, back seat of the car, I was generating all sorts of interesting AI images. Really, it sounds like it's just this unique opportunity to create this amalgam of all your interests into a single image. So it's true. So I'm seeing the Marvel, I'm seeing the the Westies. The Nazi thing is just a Captain America. Yeah, carryover? I think that's pretty much what it was. <laughs> Uh, there's a really sweet picture it made of a zombie Pikachu. I got to admit that the thing is pretty awesome. Uh, this picture it generated of a zombie Pikachu is pretty awesome. I'll have to put that up on the website. I mean, it's just it's just interesting, cool technology that it's creating. Um, I did some stuff uh, of like, I did like uh, create a young Presbyterian minister with a go goatee and it it created some pretty cool stuff. So check it out. It's ideogram, I-D-E-O-G-R-A-M dot A-I. You do have to register an account and everything you generate is public, which is, I think, good for kind of like public accountability reasons. But yeah, I got a pretty cool picture of a Pikachu dressed like Captain America, too, that I think is pretty sweet. <laughs> also, Seems a like Pika there's some a, common threads. A Pikachu fighting Darth Maul was pretty cool, too. I'll have to send you that one because I know you're a Star Wars fan. My word, that's uh, there's a, a common thread here. Yeah, yeah, I like I like Pokemon. Nobody, that's not a secret. <laughs> well, great. I feel like that'll give people something to do, even while they're listening to us. Go ahead yes. and generate a bunch of random images. Have yes. some fun. It's true. What's really interesting is if you put like entire Bible chapters or entire Bible verses or catechism questions. It does come up sometimes with like some interesting abstract interpretations of what these questions mean. Uh, full full disclaimer warning: This AI has no qualms about the second commandment, so be ready that it may present you with some images that are not uh, reformed theology compliant as far as images of 
of what the internet, what this, the AI internet thinks Jesus might've looked like. Um, so just be cautious with that, but there's some cool stuff that you can generate like this. Like I generated a picture of the entire Psalm that we're going to be talking about today. And it came up with some cool images that are kind of evocative and sort of, I don't know, they sort of like our grounds to think a little bit about what's going on. Well, I think that's as good a place as any to start. Let's talk about this, this picture. Yeah. Well, like, uh, you know, so we're talking about Psalm one today, which probably you figured out from the title of the episode, but like one image was kind of like a picture of a water waterfall with like lots of lush greenery and plants around it, which, you know, kind of talking about like a tree next to still waters. There's also a picture of a tree kind of in a desert, but it's vibrant and it's thriving. So I don't know. It's, it's just an interesting, I don't know. It's funny because I was talking to someone, we were visiting some family friends this weekend and one of the people that we visit is just a dear saint and she's just absolutely delightful. And she was asking me what I think about AI and, and I, I, calling these things artificial intelligence is almost, almost not even accurate. So like when you talk about chat GPT or notion AI, it's, it's a language model. So what it's really doing, this is super simplified, but what it's doing is it's saying, all right, if these, these 15 words appear in this order in all of the different texts I've been trained on, what's the most likely thing, the ne- most likely next word to be that's in a really simplified form, what a, ch- a language model is doing. I'm not exactly sure how these image models are working, but it's got to be something similar. So to call them artificial intelligence isn't even super accurate. There's no thinking going on. There's no like independent thought. These aren't generating creative things. It's just synthesizing different images and ideas that it's um, come up with. It's part of the reason why it has problems with like generating facial features and hands and things like that, because you can't really describe, like describe a hand, like you can't really do that. So it's, it's interesting how this stuff is working, but a lot of people freak out about it. And, and I think it does come up with some interesting kind of evocative thoughts when you put in a Bible chapter, because it's, it's taking these words that are classic historical ordered words, and then it's trying to associate them with images, but it's not always associating them in ways that we would associate them. So yeah, I mean, I think that's a kind of a fun experiment to do is toss in a whole Bible chapter. Um, I put in Genesis one, just as sort of like a fun experiment. And it came up with lots of like celestial kind of imaging, like stars. There was one that was like a, a man standing, looking up at the kind of like at the stars that I thought was an interesting interpretation of Genesis one, lots of like sunbeams and, you know, landscape scenery and stuff. But yeah, I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. I love all this AI stuff. I know some people are freaked out by it, but I think it's pretty sweet. Yeah. I, for one, welcome our AI overlords. (laughs) Well, let's talk then about Psalm 1. That's a good setup, I think, for some of the imagery. And in some ways, no, what, what we need really is a puritanical AI, where everything that you put in, every query that you make just resynthesizes that in the Puritan frame. But some of what you talked about is very puritanical. Of course, looking at the Psalms, but the scriptures generally, really sitting into every single word and thinking about, well, what tree could it be? Not yeah. from the standpoint of trying to discern what tree was intended, but merely trying to understand the characteristics of trees and therefore how that informs in a very direct way what's being said to the scriptures and how we might meditate on it. What is it that trees like to do? What constitutes a healthy tree? What makes a tree evergreen? And like you said, different climates, all that stuff, different environs. So that's there's something about that. I think that that's kind of a cool thing. And we're really coming to the tail end of spending all this time looking at the Lord's Prayer. And then now we're into this section of having gone through the Lord's Prayer this summer, and you can go back to the back catalog and check all those lovely episodes out. We're trying to understand where and how and in every way we see that same instruction that the, our Lord gives to his disciples throughout the scriptures. And we're, well, I want to talk about the Psalms, at least. I'm kind of cheating a bit here because, of course, like the Psalms are known as really the prayer book of the Bible. And it almost seemed like we couldn't leave this without at least looking at one psalm. And so the easiest way, I think, is to go to Psalm 1, which is really like the introduction of the front porches to the entire Psalter. Yeah. And really one and two coming together. But I'm hoping that we can read it, draw out some themes, come back again to this idea of what is it that our Lord is asking us to do in the prayer that he gives us to model. And then beyond that, again, just to note and to think about the fact 
that Jesus, as, as a Jew, as a man who was learned in the scriptures, who learned obedience and studied the scriptures, that so much of his teaching, so much of the quotation of his own prayer life obviously happened in the Psalms. Yeah. It was rooted and centered in the Psalter itself. And of course, even in his crucifixion, his moments of agony, he, there he is quoting from the Psalms. Yeah. So there's a lot there for us. There's a lot that's for us. It's just this lovely cohesiveness. So let me read Psalm 1, and I think we'll hear some of the AI coming out, so to speak, in the imagery <laughs> that you've already talked about. But it's worth noting that this would be a great kind of thing to have something like that generate on because there's so much just rich with so much imagery. So this is Psalm 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away, Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I want to make a kind of a bold claim, which I, it's not that bold, but let me try to like maybe possibly trigger people, but I'm going to kind of Jesus juke everybody when I do this. So one of the things that I always think about when I read this psalm and when I think of it now in light of the Lord's Prayer, the high priestly prayer and the prayer that Jesus gives to his disciples and to us to pray, is that I've often wondered, well, who is this man? You know, like it's, oh, yeah. oh, happy, oh, amazing is this man who walk, does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. And I think, of course, there's a proper understanding to some extent. It might not be the plenary kind of understanding, but there's a proper understanding in which, of course, the one who has been made righteous in Christ, the one who's justified and sanctified by the power of Christ's blood, who is called according to his purpose and whom God has redeemed is in fact this blessed man, but the blessed man. And you'll find that in some translations, there is actual, the sense is the man who we're talking about here is Jesus himself. So this psalm is almost a prayer. I'm seeing this right from the top as this great expression of God's glory and the worship that is due him, because the only reason there can be men, like lowercase men, these blessed men and women, is because there is the blessed man who yeah. doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, and who is the one that actually delights in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on that day and night in perfection, and we, to a lesser extent, only follow in that. So for me, again, this starts with like this idea of glory. All of prayer is, in some way, at its root, expressing, firstly, the glory of God. So that's where I start. I, I know that that's not like truly controversial, but to me, this is this psalm is way more about Jesus than it is about us, even as righteous yeah. men and women who have been saved by Him. Yeah. One of the things that I think, first of all, I think what's interesting when you first so talking about Psalm one or talking about picking some of the Psalms as prayers to pattern was was your idea. It's not something that I thought of. And I think part of the reason, and maybe to my own shame or detriment, the Psalms don't really feel like prayers to me. Like, I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Like, I could see singing this song. Like, I could see singing this because it, you're right. At the end of the day, Psalm 1 is is about Jesus. And then because we're united to Christ, we can sort of appropriate that to ourselves in a sort of eschatological sense and a redemptive sense. But it doesn't feel like a prayer or a psalm that I could pray, except that this is where I think we can really learn a lot from the psalms when we're talking about prayer, is that our prayer, this is going to sound really crazy, so hopefully people don't shut off the podcast, but we should, in a certain sense, pray like we were the righteous son of God, right? And and the reason I say that is not because we have obtained or or accomplished anything in and of ourselves, but there is this great exchange that happens. So when we see something like Psalm 1, or really Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are a unit, they kind of come together. They're they're in some of the manuscripts, actually, they're a single psalm that that are are seen as as one. Um we really do see Jesus front and center, right? The, the blessed man is Christ. But because we are in that blessed man, because we're in Christ, and because Christ has given us everything that is his in taking on what is ours, the, the great exchange between the first or between the second Adam and all of his progeny, 
we can pray this psalm, we can sing this psalm, we can think through this psalm as though we are the blessed man. And I think that's part of what makes the psalms so almost counterintuitive from a prayer sense. Like, I I think a lot um, about how we could sing the psalms. Like, I could sing Psalm 1 as a, like a praise song to Jesus, like I could, as a praise psalm to Jesus where I'm praising God because he's, because Jesus is blessed. He's the one who meditates on God's law day and night. He's the one who's a tree planted by streams of water. He's the one that the Lord knows his way. And I'm the one who is wicked, who doesn't stand in the congregation of the righteous, except for what Christ has done for me. That's all true and good enough as far as it goes. But there's also this element that because of what Christ has given us, I can now pray this Psalm in the first person. Right? I'm given the blessedness. I'm in Christ. I'm the blessed man who does not walk in the way of the wicked. I'm the blessed man who is like a tree planted by streams of water. So I think that's, you know, if we're looking at different biblical prayers as a way to sort of pattern our prayers, the Psalms as a whole and Psalm 1 kind of as a, of a microcosm of that really does help us to understand, I think, how it is that we are the righteous sons of God in Christ. Um, and, and that's part of why I think these are hard to get our heads around. Like I wouldn't normally go to the Psalms thinking about them as a source of like prayer examples. They just don't seem structured the way I've been taught to pray, the way that I naturally would pray. So I'm glad that we're kind of looking through these because I think it's a little bit outside of our normal wheelhouse. And I think that's always good to do. And there's a really probably slight thin line between this division of like outright prayer and singing so much of those go together. They're meant to go together. We might do better to realize that anytime we open our mouths in lyrical form with a melody that we are in a way praying, we're worshiping at least in some way because song itself is an expression of worship. So it's true that the construction of these might be a little bit different than we're used to. What we find I think in them is like enough enough continuity to express that the same themes in the Lord's prayer are everywhere present throughout the Psalms yeah. and yet enough distinction and differentiation and maybe diversity in their structure. So as to embrace all of life and do so in a way that's very honest. So it's lovely that God gives them to us because, you know, of course there are, are all kinds of Psalms. We don't need to go through the different genres of them, but what we find in each of them is some kind of really true, honest expression of what it means to be human. Yeah. And then for Jesus, take those on his lips as well and to embrace our humanity in those expressions to make that part and parcel and piecemeal of all of the worship that he himself is doing when he's walking this earth is remarkable. Yeah. So I, the themes are there. It's really strong. It's almost like it's just an, an extension. It almost, I would say, sometimes we have this tendency when it comes to the Lord's Prayer, the High Priesthood Prayer, like we over-formalize those. I don't mean that necessarily in a pejorative sense, just yeah. only to say that they become very structured, very rigid, but for good purpose. We're trying to model them exceptionally well. We're trying to be formal and very reverent in our language. And then we come to the Psalms, and as so many have said before, could your public prayers on the Lord's Day, could somebody get away with saying half the things that are in the Psalms, at least without people like, you know, raising an eyebrow? Yeah. And, and that just goes to show that there's so much there that is for us, that all of the prayer life should encompass all of what it means to be human, even if at times we're angry with God. And so we find those in the Psalms. And so really just Psalm 1 and 2, like you said, to me, it's kind of like the French doors of like the Psalms, the whole Psalter. Like it's an opening, it's ushering in. Everything that is subsequent to those Psalms is predicated on the fact that there was a man, the man, who came and was perfect, who is righteous, delights in the law of the Lord. And so these prayers which we take on our lips are because of that man. And you're right, we can pray them in the first person. We also find in them, I think what's great about this psalm and some others, when you force yourself, honestly, to pray like this with these words, you do get into a different, I think, kind of realm or like focus of admiration and adoration for God. Because like you said, it sounds like, it seems like it's easier to sing, but if you take these on your lips and like your time private prayer and say, I'm going to pray through this, stop, pause, reflect, or turn these into my own words as I pray them out loud to God, what you're finding is like, you're really trying to hallow his name in the way that God has commanded that his name be high and lifted up. And that does sound, sometimes we have like a tin ear toward that because we don't know how to do that. So these, I think like the, the Psalms really like, 
enumerate or elaborate, like flesh out some of the themes that we see in the other prayers that we've talked about, but they do so, do so with a lot more in different words and kind of like different focus altogether, yeah. whether it be anger, lament, praise, you know, worship, adoration, like it's all there, but God is so big. His name ought to be so hallowed that even all those things can and do in fact bring him worship and praise. And so the Psalms must be diverse enough, must be strange enough in a way so that it can reflect the strangeness of the human condition and the experience. And still in all those things, have it be wrapped up in a prayer that comes before God in which he's glorified. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, the fact that the Psalms feel a little bit um, alien to us, first and foremost, I think that's just because in our sort of evangelical subculture and, and just the context that most of us have come up through and and in, we're not used to praying and singing the Psalms. So there's certainly an element of that, but there's also an element that like, these are divine songs and prayers that are patterned after God's thoughts and not the thoughts of man. Right. And, and all prayer, whether it's um, extemporaneous or whether it's like written out prayer, it's all still coming out of the the hearts of man, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? We we should pray extemporaneously, publicly. We should be praying from our own thoughts and our own words in our private prayers. But there's something about the Psalms that feels alien to us because it is alien to us, and I think that's part of why it's so important to spend time thinking through and praying through the Psalms. So like Psalm one is one of the first Psalms that I memorized. Um, you know, I've memorized a few different Psalms and I think a lot of people have memorized either part or all of Psalm 23, just because it's such a classic text, but the rest of the Psalms, they, they feel very different. And I, I think that's part of maybe part of why God has put them in the Bible is because it it sort of gives us a glimpse into um, how God would structure our prayers. And, and we don't have to guess at that. We don't have to just right. go based on principles, which is fine. God does give us principles. Obviously, we, we've spent... And we're on like episode 15 now of this private prayer series, you know, sort of structure on the Lord's Prayer. Obviously, God gives us some principles by which to structure our prayers. But he also gives us straight out prayers to pray in the form of the Psalms. And they're not really in the structure and the format that we would naturally think to pray. And that's why it's so important to spend time in the Psalms, because it really does structure and reorient our, our prayers. Right? What is that famous book, like The Trellis and the Vine? That that's like a total, a totally apt analogy for how the Psalms can function in um, our prayer life and in our praise, kind of our musical singing praise life, is that a, a vine will grow following the trellis, following whatever structure you put it on. And that's where you see some of these like really elaborate um, trellises that will shape the vine into these really beautiful sort of almost architectural designs. Well, the Psalms function in the same way. If you really get the Psalms like into your heart and into your mind, it will change the way that you think about prayer because I've actually heard people say things like there are certain Psalms that are no longer appropriate for Christians to pray, like the imprecatory Psalms. And that's almost, that's, I, I won't say it's blasphemous because I think these, the people who say stuff like that have really good intentions, but to think that God gave us a hymn book and a prayer book in the Old Testament and then and then said, like, well, certain ones are just off limits because it doesn't fit the New Testament church. I was reading, um, I think it was Psalm 109 today, and some of it is like really shocking language. And we're talking about Psalm 1 specifically, but Psalm 1 as a way to sort of intro into and sort of discuss the whole Psalter our prayer life does not typically reflect the structures that we see in the Psalms. And I think you can kind of approach that one of two ways. You can look at that and be like, well, we've kind of like grown past that, or it's for an antiquated age. Or we can recognize that God's 
God's prayer book, God's hymn book is something that is given to us. It's profitable for us. It's it's useful for our teaching and our correction. And that has to also mean it's useful for our correction in terms of the way that we think about prayer and the way we actually pray. I think that's right on. I mean, I, I, I'm with you. I think that's kind of like the Psalms, or some of them at least are in a bear market. And we think of them as great as songs of worship, but maybe in our private lives, we find them helpful and devotional as we might read them and kind of metabolize their themes. But to say like we should take them on our lips from our perspective or that we can find in them really a perfect accompaniment or covering over of any kind of experience that we have. So the more we talk about this, the more I think my frame is moving in this direction whereby we have the Lord's Prayer and there's these fundamental themes like really strongly crystallized and distilled down. And the Psalms really provide for us like an exemplification of all the details of those themes, including the fact that, like you said, some of those imprecatory Psalms, like Psalm 69, the Psalms in the 100s, that sometimes all you want to cry out, like if you're, unless you're not human, but I am, sometimes all you want to cry out is like, God, save me, like help yeah. me. Like how long are you not listening to the things I'm saying here that I'm in pain or discomfort or that things seem to be crumbling all around me. And so I think like that's more where our prayers need to be oriented a lot of the time. Because while we're praying things like, your kingdom come, your will be done, there might be part of us that's saying, I don't really like what's going on right now. Yeah. And what I want for your kingdom to come is to like be gone with all this injustice or to heal my loved ones. Why are you not listening to me? It seems like these are the kind of things that you would love to intercede and to do for your glory. And, and I'll worship you in those and still our prayers seem like they're falling flat. And so to have somebody come alongside and basically give you permission, like divine permission to say, pray that thing. And, and in some ways it's not yeah. even just permission it's saying, pray this way, lament over prayer. Like, I, you know, like I, we really should push against the kind of singing or praying that somehow is going to dance at the grave of Lazarus. Yeah. You know, we need to know that it's okay to lament and to say strong things to God because he's large enough to be able to handle our questions. So even in Psalm 1, what I find interesting is like the orientation it takes us on because I think the latter part from like verses 4 through 6, to your point, are not things that like kind of probably pop up in like the ACTS acronym of prayer. And, yeah. and that's okay. But when the psalmist here is saying things like, the wicked will not stand in judgment. I mean, think about what it is to pray this kind yeah. of thing. It's like to orient our minds to this idea that there is judgment. That's it. I mean, think how helpful this is actually for understanding of like prayer, what it means to speak to God, what it means to understand who he is, and to do that in the context of conversation with him. We're saying, listen, there's a judge. It is you, God. You're near. The judge stands at the door. The dead shall be judged out of the things that are written in the books according to their works. They cannot flee this dread tribunal. There's no escape. There's no mass that can hide their guilt. All our sins are recorded. No blood blots out the stains of those who reject the Savior, who reject Christ. Yeah who have no interest in the saving cross. And what we're basically saying is, God, you are glorified. Your name is hallowed in your perfect and righteous judgment when you come against those who are your enemies. And again, to your point, like really prayer does so much more in changing us than of course it does in trying to influence God. While yet at the same time, of course, he receives our prayers lovingly and desires for us to communicate with him. But this is a way of, in many ways, a prayer is in some way rehearsing all of the scriptures in conversation with God yeah, and rehearsing the scriptures in a way in which if the scriptures tell us the truth about reality and actually describe the human condition with complete perfection and are sensitive to it and provide a remedy for our sin, then really our prayer should be more robust than just simple phrases because really they must have emotion. And I think sometimes if you're like me and it's, it can be difficult to express that, the Psalms force us into that. And sometimes you'll pick up a Psalm like you're saying and be like, my word, there is really strong language here. Like almost the kind of thing that you're like, how is this in the scriptures? It's being prayed to God. And, uh, you know, of course, something like the Trinity Psalter has, has written, you know, a a song for each of those things. And some of those are very, very interesting. Like I think even with those, there would be congregations that would deign to sing those on the Lord's day. And yet they have a place but that place is because like we are people and we have a God who loves us and we need a God who is strong and mighty and like diagnoses and leans in close to the human condition and is well acquainted with suffering. And so I, I think you're right. Like the Psalms, we need them because we need them because they orient us toward the life of prayer that is authentic and real. And when, if you do this exercise, which I think is good, I'm trying to do this myself, is just go through the Psalms each day 
And rather than just simply reading them, there's nothing wrong with that, of course, or simply studying them, and that also is profitable, trying to actually pray them. Yeah. And to pray them in a way where you relate them to what's going on in your life. One I've found, and I don't think this should surprise anybody, that no matter what that psalm is, no matter what day it appears on, there is something intensely resonating that I never saw coming. And the second thing is that it's helped me to understand what it means to really bear my heart before God in a way that's unreserved. If only I'm forced into that position because I wouldn't normally put myself there, but the psalm is helping me to think in those ways. In some ways, it's like a lesser version of like the ideogram. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. giving you the proper idea and way to think about praying when we might be content with maybe prayers that aren't particularly deep, even if we're trying to model them off the Lord's prayer. Like the Lord's prayer is like the introduction. It starts us off with the Psalms in flesh so much more of all those themes in a very like pragmatic way. Yeah. And I think too, one of the things that I found really helpful with the Psalms, and this ties into what I was saying earlier about kind of like the Psalms being a structure for us to, to emulate, but also it's a structure that we grow into. You know, I was thinking about like Psalm 1, as I was kind of mentally preparing for this episode, we don't do any actual preparation preparation for this episodes, but as I was thinking through this, we don't often pray in a way that recognizes God's judgment over the wicked. Right. Exactly. And that is one of those elements of theology. You know, when we're done with this prayer series here, we're going to we're going to move into some discussion about eschatology and we're not going to we're going to not get bogged down in like pre-mill versus post-mill. That that's not really we've done episodes on that. We don't need to redo those. But one of the things about judgment that I think a lot of modern Christians miss is the judgment of the wicked is a source of comfort for the righteous. Exactly. And that's that's a constant refrain in the Psalms, is that the psalmist, whether it's David or, or a psalm that is not attributed or a psalm that's attributed to somebody else, there's this constant refrain in the Psalms that the judgment will be righteous judgment, and that those who are enemies of God and therefore enemies of God's people will, in a certain sense, get what is coming to them. You know, I... I over the summer when your your dad, who's my pastor, was out on medical leave and I filled the pulpit with him, I was just amazed in the book of James how frequently that theme comes back, that, that God will give justice to those who are his. And that means that those who are oppressing those who are his will get the judgment that is coming to them. And there's a source of comfort that comes with that. And I think you know, there's a certain evangelical niceness and a sort of evangelical, um, I don't know, this is going to sound really weird, but there's almost like a hope that a lot of modern evangelicals have that like nobody's actually going to get punished for their sin. No, nobody's actually going to go to hell. Nobody's actually going to face God's judgment. That is that would be great. I mean, I think there's a certain element of like, we all wish that universalism was true, that somehow God had worked it out that all people would be saved. But it's also to God's glory that he's going to judge the wicked. And that's not something we often are comfortable or familiar with praying. But it's also the kind of thing where when we face um, kind of like persecution with a capital P, which most of us who are recording or listening to this podcast never have actually faced and probably never will in our lifetimes. Um, but when people face persecution of any kind, but especially real serious persecution, the fact that those who are, are oppressing and persecuting God's people will get what's coming to them in the grand eschatological sense that actually is a source of comfort, and Psalm 1 gives us not only warrant, but I would say a command to pray that to that effect, right? We can come to the Lord and say, Lord, you are good and you're glorious, and you will reward those whom you have chosen and whom you have made righteous, but you will also, you will also condemn and judge those who are your enemies who persist in their sin right? The wicked will not stand in the judgment. That is a statement 
that is intended to give hope to those who are who belong to the Lord, right? And the, as the sort of introduction to the Psalms, right? Psalm one and Psalm two serve as kind of an introduction to the Psalter as a whole. And as an introduction to the Psalm, this is this is something that sets the tone for all of the lament songs. Whether it's Psalm 22, which is one of the most famous lament songs, which Christ himself appropriates to his suffering on the cross, like all of those lament songs take place in the context of the wicked will not stand in the judgment, right? The the sinner will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. That is a source of hope that I don't think we're used to praying and to praising God for. I know I'm not. Like when I face some sort of... Um, moral evil at the hands of someone who is an enemy of God, which doesn't happen often, but it's not unheard of for me to, to have to sort of like stand in the face of something that is really just coming my way because the person hates God. And I'm, I'm a Christian that, that happens. I'm not used to praying and thanking God that the wicked will not stand in the judgment. And, and I think that's because we sort of have this perspective of like, well, we should be evangelizing everybody, which we should. We definitely should be praying for the salvation of even those who are wicked and who harm us. We should be praying for our enemies. But there's also comfort that comes in recognizing that those who persist in that sinful state of being God's enemies will ultimately get the judgment that is coming to them. Yeah, and sometimes there's a sense like we feel, I think, or maybe I'll just speak for myself, you can feel guilty about that kind of approach. Yeah. It kind of sounds like it's coming across as like, go get him, God, yeah. go get him. Right. And instead, it's more about the fact that think about all of the places in your life where you yourself, or your loved ones or others around the world that you know of have experienced some kind of injustice where it's just wrongdoing for, for no reason, just except right. that the world is broken and somebody is exerting power or influencing over over somebody else and has literally wronged them. And where is that justice? And sometimes it does not occur here. So the fact that God will write that, so to speak, that there will be the appropriate the appropriate amount of retribution and that God will execute that judgment with like perfection. There will be no mistakes, no mistrials, no bad justice. It's all going to happen in perfect righteousness. Yeah. And so then it, it leads then from that, like verse five, recognizing, like you said, the godly or not could the ungodly rather not stand in the judgment. Um, and then it goes to this idea of amid all of the trials of those who are righteous, the ones who are justified and fighting every day in sanctification by the power of the Holy Spirit to live out in practice what it means to be the one who is justified. For them, amid all their trials, their sorrows, pains, their reproaches, let those righteous ones lift up the rejoicing heads. That's yeah. what this prayer is about. The eye of God rests on their way. He called them to the narrow road. He upholds them with all of our feeble steps. He safely leads us to the glorious end. Unfailing watchfulness surrounds those whom God loves. All of that is happening in this prayer. It's the give us our daily bread. Yeah. It's the seeing that what, where God protects and provides he does so out of great loving kindness and where he executes judge, judgment and righteousness, he does so out of great loving kindness. The simplicity of God is enfolded all throughout this Psalm. And you're right. There's again, language in here that I think we just have to get comfortable with that. God is a righteous God. He is a, a God who is justly filled with wrath. And so whether it's here or in something like Psalm 90, which is one of the few Psalms written by Moses, where uh, I'm looking up right now, 90 verse seven so, for we have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath, we have been dismayed. You have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. And then a little bit further down, verse 11, who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear of the Lord that is due you? And then that famous verse, so teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. So I think that the Psalms, again, force us into not just all the feels of humanity and all the responses and all the conversations that we ought to have with God, but it does force us to say like, how often do we, in our time of prayer, do we reflect really on how we ought to be consumed by the anger of God, that God is in fact angry, that he is filled with wrath over the injustice in the world and that he only just for a time withholds that until the full judgment occurs. But even then, that, that judgment has been poured out on Christ for the sake of those whom he has elected, those who he has gathered onto himself. And I love this idea. Like, again, only the Psalms can give us these things to pray with, like, full 
impunity, so to speak. Like we can just say these things because God has allowed us to say them. And, and like you said, I think even more than a warrant commands us to that verse 11, who understands the power of your anger? Like what a great thing to pray. You know, it's yeah. basically saying, I don't even understand your anger. I don't understand its power. I don't understand its course. I don't even understand the, under the magnitude of it because if I really did, I'd be more contrite than I am right now. Yeah. Who, who can understand your fury and the fear that is due you? It's like the most honest thing to pray, which is, God, I've read your scriptures. You've been so kind in general and specific revelation to us. And even then, I don't understand you as I ought to. I feel like my mind is so cloudy that my eyes are still so scaled over that my ears are still incredibly stopped up. And so all I can do is say, who understands the power of your anger yeah. and your fury according to the fear that's due you? This is like, the, I think, the best guide for prayer. It takes everything in the Lord's Prayer and says, I really believe this, that the Psalms, the Psalter, is, encompasses all of human experience and just puts it in prayer language for us yeah. so that we can use it. And we ought to use it because we just set it aside and say, like, well, when the time comes, I'll pray the thing I want to pray. I think this gets us automatically in the rhythm. So one, just like Jesus, when the time comes, when he's suffering on the cross, he knows how to pray. And he notice he's not praying exclusively from like even the high priestly prayer at that moment or from the prayer that he gives his disciples. He's praying from the Psalms. Yeah. But that Psalm, that, that scarlet thread that runs through the Psalms is of course the same one that we find in the Lord's Prayer. I just think they're they're underutilized. We yeah. we gotta get back at that. And the singing is great. Like I'm pro psalmody, of course, pro singing the Psalms. I'm even more pro sing them in your personal life, pray them in your secret prayer closet, pray them together. But when you force yourself to pray through them, I think you're going to, like you said, you're going to be praying themes that probably would like automatically just fly by you. Yeah. That you either wouldn't embrace, you wouldn't think to embrace, you wouldn't think that you could say to God directly. Or again, it's you're experiencing something that you will later benefit from. But in that particular season of life, it's maybe not a particular prayer that is heartfelt. But it is one that you'll find, like you'll have a rubric for when that time comes. Yeah, I think one of the things, you know, I, memorizing Psalm 1 has been something that's been super formative in my life. And, and so I would just really challenge and encourage people. It, it's not very long. It's not, it's not a difficult psalm to memorize. But there are often times when I feel discouraged in my faith, whether it's it's because of external pressures or just sort of like internal pressures of feeling like, I, I don't know. I don't know if, if you ever feel this way, but sometimes I feel like um, this is like super hard to even articulate. Sometimes it feels like God doesn't understand. Like that's a weird thing to right. say, but like it feels like God doesn't really get me. He doesn't really understand where I'm coming from and like what I'm dealing with. And the reality is God knows the way of the righteous. Like right it's, it's not that obviously has a specific connotation and a specific phrasing. And it comes in the context of, and the contrast of knowing the ways of the righteous and the ways of the wicked perishing. There's a specific context to it, but there's almost an aud audacity to praying the Psalms that if it wasn't for the fact that this was the inspired hymn book and the inspired prayer book of of God, that that would almost be inappropriate to say some of the things that God gives us to pray in the Psalms, right? Um, it, it, there, I don't have any particular Psalm in mind, but there's some of the Psalms where like the psalmist is pretty stinking demanding of God, like remember me, O Lord, and do this for me, and right. and and don't forget to bless me, like don't forget your covenant promises to me. There's an audacity to the Psalms. This is, sounds super like charismatic and name it and claim it, but the Psalms not only give us warrant and um, grounding to demand things of God, but they they're because of their presence in the Scripture, we're commanded to demand certain things of God. And the the reality of the phrase in Psalm one that God God knows the ways of the righteous. That's a, you know, we could get into all the like Hebrew about like, this is a knowing of intimacy. It's not just a bare knowledge, but the reality is God knows the ways of the righteous because he walks with the righteous and he establishes their path. He establishes their way, right? He makes level uneven ground and he prepares a highway for his people. Um, that is a promise in the scriptures that I know myself personally is not something that I frequently think to pray, but 
when I'm working on memorizing the Psalms and I'm, I'm bringing to mind Psalm one, I'm automatically being brought to these patterns of prayer that God has established for his people that are alien and counterintuitive to me. And for that reason, I think it's even more important for us to ground our prayers and establish our prayers in the Psalms because they're not the kind of thing that we would pray normally. I would normally not seek to find comfort in the fact that God intimately knows and has established the ways, established my ways not because I'm righteous, but because Christ is righteous, but he's established and knows my ways because I'm among the righteous. I am counted among the sons of God, and I'm, I've been granted all of the privileges that come with that status because of who Christ is. But because of that, he knows my ways. So when I'm struggling, when I'm being oppressed, when I'm facing persecution, when I'm just discouraged— I can take comfort in the fact that he knows my ways, even in that dark valley, right? Even when Christ is praying, when he's saying, why have you forsaken me? And he's praying elements of Psalm 22 on the cross. God still knew the ways of the righteous, even in Christ's despair on the cross. And that's like a super, almost like a stylized example. It's like a, like a hyperbolic example of what I'm talking about. But when I'm praying and I'm in sort of a despair or I'm in, in discouragement, God still knows my ways, even in the midst of that discouragement. And the fact that he does not abandon me and still intimately knows my ways and walks with me in those ways that should be a source of encouragement designed to bring me out of that dark valley. And I think that's just, a, it's just a, a very different way of thinking about how God encourages us. That was probably very, very um, almost natural and instinctive to the Jewish mind because of how shaped by the Psalms, the prayer life of the Jewish people was and the praise life of the Jewish people. We're just not there as evangelicals, right. as, as modern evangelists, even as like reformed, reformed evangelicals who have a special place in our praise and in our prayer for the Psalms. We're just not shaped by the Psalms the way, uh, the way that I think we should be. Bob Godfrey has a really good, a really good book uh, published by Ligonier. I think it was called L Learning to Love the Psalms. Yes. Um, I didn't finish it, but but m I read most of it. It was extremely good, and it shaped a lot of my thinking on how we appropriate and think about the Psalms in this context. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. People should look up that book. I think like the, just say it this way, like there is a prayer like life hack. And that is, yeah. I think so, so many of us oftentimes feel like ill-equipped, even in our personal life after a long day or the beginning of a, a busy day of uh, being able to articulate things we want to say. And because the Psalms already are so rich in their expression, they have all this beautiful language. They're so poetic. The life hack is just pray the Psalms, yeah, open up the Psalms sure. and move through them. You do one a day. And again, I think the challenge is like, you know, somebody's going to be like, well, how do I know which one to pray? Like maybe one day I feel like it doesn't matter. Just, just start. And when you become more familiar with them, I suppose you could Google them if you're feeling like you're in a particular season of life and you want a lamenting psalm, you can do that, or a precatory psalm, you can do that as well. But I think there's also just something better, brilliant with just letting God determine the order of things. Yeah. Just read through them. Take one a day and, and pray through them. And what you'll find is exactly what we're talking about, like in verse 3, for instance. This poetic language, which like maybe with enough time we might be drawn to, we might like create on our own this idea of this tree that's planted by rivers of water but just thinking about this like tree on this verdant brook whose roots drink constantly of this flowing stream and this is what god gives us to help us to understand what it means to have like this life that is actually righteous that in the midst of a, a particular environment here is this tree and it's just growing and it's bearing lots of fruit and it doesn't have to worry because it's anchored deeply in the right place. And we can think of like the biggest trees we've ever seen and how stately and majestic they are and how solid and rigid and old and have seen so many things. And they've been resolute and firm and steadfast in the midst of all of life. And all of that happens in the course of like a dozen words. Yeah. So to think about that and to pray that is just different. I don't, I'm not, not naturally drawn to that kind of language and it's okay. And it's lovely because the, creativity is really the bane of, I'd say, good worship music and good praying. And so like we have in the scriptures so much already that's already written for us to process and to pray, to take as our own, because God says, this is for you. And so you ought to use it. And so all this language, this beautiful stuff, and even the hard stuff, like you said, the there are some like 69, for instance, like when David is praying that like his enemies would be made like childless, like that there'd be orphans. Yeah. Like these are hard things. 
And yet I think we're made to wrestle with what it means that he's praying those things and to understand what it means that, again, God is righteous and holy, and this holiness comes at a cost. So I'm with you. I think that maybe if we, we, we encourage people to do is one, they should look at that book. Uh, what is it? Is Learning to Love the Psalms? I think it's Remember called it Learning to Love the Psalms. Yeah, it's by yes. Bod Godfrey. It was published by Ligonier. Um, it's a it's a relatively it's short book. I'm not honestly, I'm not sure why I never finished it. I just never got all the way through it. But it it really is. I guess maybe I would phrase it this way. Sometimes it feels like um, it's hard to know which psalm to pray in which context. But the way that I would push back on that is that there's never an inappropriate time to pray, yeah, ex- pray any ex- psalm. Exactly. And, just do And it. that's the beauty of the psalms. Like Calvin calls it like the prayer book of the soul. And, and there's all sorts of language around, you know, it, it touches every element of the human condition. All of that's true. But even like the imprecatory psalms that feel like they must have just this really specific context, I think that you'll find if you actually spend time to just pray. So he, like you're not sure which psalm to pray, ask Google to give you a, a random number between 100 and 1 or 1 and 150 and pray that psalm. Like it's it's really that simple or just like open the book of Psalms and pray whichever one that happens to catch your eye first. And you're never going to run into a time where you're praying the wrong thing because this is God's inspired prayer book. So yes, there are certainly Psalms that fit circumstances better than others, but you know, like take Psalm 23, for example, people often think of Psalm 23 as like the Psalm they pray when they're in like really like dark situations but that's because like the middle of the psalm is about the valley of the shadow of death. But you could equally pray about God providing for you. You could equally pray about God um, preparing a place for you in the presence of your enemies or God preparing a special task or a special uh, a special purpose for you when he anoints your head with oil and your cup overflows. You could use that phrasing about your cup overflowing as as a, a means of being thankful for God's many blessings, even a short Psalm like Psalm one or Psalm 23, literally I think could fit just about any circumstance. So I just think this is kind of one of those things where we talk about like the best way to start running is just to like tie your shoes and start running. Like th- there's no, there's no preparation for running except to just like start running. And, and I think praying the Psalms is the same way. If you, if you only get ready to pray the Psalms, you never actually start. There's nothing to right. do except to start. And there's no wrong way to start. And I think that's maybe that's the takeaway from the episode. Just just start doing it. There, there's nothing you can't go wrong with praying the Psalms. There's no wrong way to do it. Um, obviously, you can misapply scripture and you have to be intentional and careful. So, like a good commentary, if you're wondering about the context or you're worried about that, would be fine. Psalm. Calvin has great commentaries on the Psalms. There's lots of good stuff in Matthew Henry if you're looking for the in, individual information about particular Psalms. But these, a lot of times the Psalms are left almost contextless, specifically, I think, by the Holy Spirit to make it so you can pray these Psalms in almost any circumstance. I just think you have to get started. You just have to do it. I totally agree with that. I think that should be like our call, our clarion call is, and I'm with you, just pray through them starting at one. You can't go wrong with that. You could certainly do some randomizing. That would also be appropriate, but it's, it's just to invest. And sometimes I think it's helpful to have your contact, your context shifted or your circumstances rearranged a little bit to help you appreciate something from the scriptures in a different way. So here's what I would recommend even above and beyond that. This is what everybody should do. Go out, and there's lots of versions of this. Get yourself a pocket version of just the Psalms. They exist. And yeah. put it in a place in your house that's just out on your desk on your kitchen counter, so that you're reminded, this is a prayer book. Is it the scriptures? Yes. Is it your prayer book? Yes. And it's you've you've extrapolated, you've taken it out, so to speak, of its context, not to dislocate it from the larger wisdom of God, but to say, I'm going to hold this in kind of a special place in my prayer life so that I have it ready and available to me, like I would any other prayer book that anybody else has written. Even you know, There's lots of great prayer books, Valley of Vision, we've talked about that before, but nothing trumps having the Psalms at your disposal easily, so that when you have a couple minutes, or you're sitting down for prayer, or maybe it is that time where you're really struggling with something, you have it right there for you, and you're thinking, this is the book I go to. This is the place I start yeah. when I want to have a time of private communing with God. I start with the Psalms. So I have my own preference there. I have a lovely, tiny little version of the Lexi Standard Bible 
that's a little little handsome version. You know, Paul also there's something like cute and adorable about you know like small versions of like the <laughs> scripture. But you, do you know what I'm saying? Like to have that at the ready, and it, for it to be something that's again like separated from like the larger compendium of the scriptures, and it's just available to you in a pragmatic way. And you start to think about this book as like this is where I start my time of prayer, or yeah. in my time of prayer, or in my midst of my time of prayer is really helpful. I think we need to change our frame on this and see the Psalms not just as another part of the scriptures, but as a part that was like specifically engineered so that we, we would use it in the waxing and waning and the throes of life yeah. to pray and cry out to God using the words that he's given to us, which again are reflected in the Lord's Prayer, but I think in my view are enumerated and elaborated to a greater extent. So yeah. just go grab yourself a copy somewhere. There's like myriad versions of this. Oh yeah, for sure. But it's so helpful to have just the Psalms at your disposal and to think of that as your prayer book. Yeah. Well, Jesse, I think that probably is going to wrap it up for this uh, this episode. I, I think this is just, I don't think we can we can underscore this enough. Like, this is one of the insights, I think, of the Reformed perspective on things. Um, I remember, I remember this, I don't know why exactly this comes to mind, but I remember, I think it was Rod Rosenblatt from, from Whitehorse in fame. Who's kind of like a, I don't know. He's kind of like the Lutheran version of R.C. Sproul in some ways. And I remember an, it must've been an episode of the, the Whitehorse in that he was on, but he was talking about how like part of the reason you sing things like the Te Deum or like classic hymns is like, if you get in a car accident and you're, you're about to die, like those are the things that will come to mind. And there's like, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but how much better would it be if the Psalms were the thing that comes to mind? Like in your last dying moments, the Psalms are what is so ingrained into your spirit and your heart and in your brain that when the lights start to go out, Psalm one is what comes to mind, right? That the Lord knows the ways of the righteous or that the Lord is my shepherd or that the Lord said to my Lord, sit in my right hand. Like all of these different classical statements out of the Psalms. So I think maybe just to close it out, like just go, just go do it. Like shut off the podcast and go read the Psalms and then pray the Psalms. Like it's, it's not, it's not rocket science. Like it's, it's a relatively <laughs> straightforward proposition and I think we could we could muddy the waters by talking a lot about like strategies and different ways to apply the Psalms, but we don't need to do any of that. Like God has given us this prayer book, just go and pray it. Like just if you want to go running, like just put your shoes on and go running. If you want to pray the Psalms, just pick up the Psalter and start praying the Psalms. So I don't I don't want to belabor the point. I don't want to stretch this out more than we have to. Um, but it, it's just it's it's one of those things that's almost so simple that I think we've all missed it. Like it's one of those, it's so right in front of our faces. And I, I just think the reform tradition really does a good job at it. And that comes in the form of like the Puritan perspective or the Puritan impulse to sing the Psalms, to regulate our lives by scripture and to, to let the, the hymn book and the prayer book of the scriptures be the regulation that structures and constrains our own prayers. And I think too, like if you're praying, and you couldn't see your prayers finding a place in the Psalter. Like if you can't ground what you're praying, obviously like we're not, we're not advocating just pray the words of the Psalter, but if your prayers are radically alien to and contradictory to what you see in the Psalms, that's also a source that should give us some pause. I think. Yeah. It's a good way. It's the, it's the benchmark, isn't it? It's the paragon. It's something by which we ought to really do compare both in form and, and content. So I'm with you. The theme here is just go and do it. Grab yourself a copy, go to your favorite app and just start doing that. Speaking of going to your favorite app, whatever your podcast app is, we're so grateful, of course, for everybody that downloads and listens and joins in the Telegram chat and makes sure that all of this happens without charge and there's no paywalls. There is no purple mattress advertisements (laughs) throughout there's not going to be any kind of weird jingle that happens in the middle of what we're talking about. And so for those that continue after satisfying all of the requirements and their ties and their offerings, there are local churches who say, you know what? I have a little bit left over. I'd like to give to the Reformed Brotherhood to make sure that all those things continue to be available to everybody without any kind of compulsion free of charge. We are so grateful. And I want to especially thank Brother James who joined through patreon.com this past week. 
yeah. in giving. And I'm always floored by this. We're reminded that there are people listening from all over the world. And we know that Brother James is not from the U.S. because his lovely gift is made in a currency that's not U.S. dollars. So I'm um, just reminded that uh, you can give no matter where you are in the world. If you go to patreon.com backslash reform brotherhood, all these little gifts, they come together. They count for a lot and they make sure that all the catalog, everything is out there. So when people are searching all over the world for some kind of random content and they come upon us, they can freely download that episode and listen to you and I talk about it and hopefully be encouraged by that and then have their That's own true. conversations. Be, go, go back to the scriptures. Be transformed because God is good and he sees the way of the righteous. It's true. Well, Jesse, I've been practicing this all week. So like a ton of, <laughs> a ton of pressure on me. But until next time, honor everyone. Love the brother. Yeah.